Thursday afternoon at the end of a long week of programming, if you've been coming to some of our other events. Um, so we really appreciate you joining us um, to hear from our CTRL student partners. So I'll be joined today by Reba, Kamaya, Allison, and Nathaniel, who will introduce themselves as it um, comes time for them to share their work, as well as my colleague, Gavin Frome, who I'll let introduce themselves. I love the I love the accent you always put on my name. It's hi, my name is Fromme. Gavin Fromey, but uh, I guess you can call me Gavin Fromey. Um, yeah. And I am a, a graduate student at um, AU in the history department, but I've been working at CTRL as a graduate assistant for about four or five years now um, with the teaching and learning team. And it has been my great pleasure to uh, have joined Hannah and the student partners on this uh, pilot version of our student partners program. Um, the student partners that we've had working with us these past uh, few months have done an amazing job of coming together and developing these projects that we are very excited to share with you today. Um, Hannah, would you be so kind as to proceed to the next slide? So as a form of welcome, we'd like you to post in the chat uh, what you hope to gain from hearing student perspectives. Uh, what brought you here? What, do you, what is it that interests you about student perspectives as, a, as an instructor? So Adam, it seems, is looking forward to gleaning some ideas about how to become a better teacher for students. And I think that uh, sentiment is echoed. Oh, now they're coming in fast. Um, <laughs> yeah, it seems a lot of people are interested in becoming uh, better instructors for their students. Um, Donna is interested in hearing uh, stories from students. Um, Shed wants students to know they care about their input. That's a great uh, incentive. I, I like that. Um, a lot of uh, wanting to hear student perspectives to improve teaching. Um, Brenda, providing students what they need and want. So. Laura says to learn about equity, diversity, especially from how uh, students perceive the issues. So a lot of uh, a lot of similar sentiments uh, going around in the chat. A lot of people are interested in getting the student perspective on on uh, teaching and learning so that they can improve their own teaching practices and better serve the needs of students which I think you're in the right place. This is going to be a recurring theme throughout much of the uh, presentations today. Um, so Hannah, if you'd be so kind as to go to the next slide. Sure, and uh, before I do that, I did oh, yeah. I to highlight one comment I noticed. Mm -hmm. um, I think from Alyssa, this idea of, 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 we talk a lot at CTRL about the importance of getting feedback from the students in your courses while you're working with them, while you're teaching them. But then also this, there's a value in hearing from students who are not in your courses and they might be more likely to share openly and honestly. And um, certainly these student partners are here to um, share some open and honest feedback that you might not hear from students who are thinking about you grading them at the end of the semester. <laughs> so absolutely. Um, so with that in mind, I'll pass yeah. back to Gavin for the session guidelines. <laughs> Absolutely. So for our session today, um, we'd like you to add questions and ideas into the chat. After each presenter, there will be time for a brief Q&A. Um, and we would like you to agree, hopefully, to be respectful, um, to honor each other uh, and our differences, be open-minded. Um, we invite rather than dismiss different perspectives. Engaged, um, we actively participate in a way that works for us. 
growth minded, uh, growth oriented, I should say. Uh, we seek to learn new ideas, not just confirm and active, be an active listener. Um, we listen to understand and not just to respond. Um, so please, uh, you know, uh, uphold those guidelines and, you know, consider those as uh, solid guidelines for your course or for, for good conversations in general, I'd say. Um, and I, yeah. I will note too that these guidelines um, are a, I guess, a simplified version of the guidelines that when Kamaya, Ali, Nate, and Reba were in my class last fall, um, that the class came up with as a class community. So they're directly as a result of a conversation with those students. Cooperatively created. Um, so now for the learning outcomes. By the end of the session, you will be able to identify various challenges and, and barriers to equity present at AU. You'll be able to apply specific student recommended strategies to improve your teaching, as many of you were looking to do. And you will be able to reflect on student perspectives, or excuse me, perceptions of how to create more inclusive and effective teaching and learning environments at AU. Um, all of these student uh, projects are different from one another in terms of the specific uh, methodologies or the goals, but ultimately I think you'll find that a lot of them uh, achieve similar ends in terms of promoting a um, more respectful environment at AU and a more equitable learning experience. Uh, for today's agenda, um, Hannah will be providing an overview of the student partners program and uh, intro an introduction to the specific student partners. Um, follow that will be Allison, uh, who will be increasing uh, inclusivity within STEM classes. Um, then Nate will be going into varying means of participation to support all learners. And uh, finally, Ali and Reba, excuse me, Ali, Kamaya and Reba will be uh, presenting on their project, enhancing the education, the educator student dynamic at AU. Um, so with that, Hannah, would you be so kind as to provide a bit of background about the student partners program? Sure, yeah, I just want to go over a very brief context um, before we jump into what you're all here for and hear from the students. But uh, as Gavin mentioned on the title slide, this is a new initiative for CTRL, um, and these students helped to pilot this program. As I mentioned, they all were in class with me in the fall and um, were very um, you know, willing to kind of engage in this relatively unknown um, process in that we we built this program together essentially and now in the fall we'll be um, bringing in new student partners from across campus and we'll be doing that con continuously so the goals we have for the program are that the student partners will gain professional skills and leadership experience increase self-efficacy confidence and employability develop awareness as learners and generate unique contributions that will benefit the wider AU community which may include um, written resources as all these students have put together and we'll share links to those uh, at the end of the session, as well as putting on events like this one. Um, and in line with that, ideally instructors, staff and administrators will critically reflect on diversities in perspective and personal experiences among students at AU, reconceptualize learning and teaching as a collaborative practice in which students' insights are valued and applied, and then demonstrate transformed thinking about teaching by applying students' viewpoints and perspectives. So I think these goals are aligned with what you all shared in the chat as why you're here. So that was great to see. Um, and some more context just to give you an idea of what we all did together as a group um, and how this program has functioned and will function going forward. So, um, Starting in the beginning of last semester, these students worked directly with uh, the teaching and learning team with Gavin and I and our colleagues to bring their voice and perspective into the conversation about teaching and learning at AU. So that looked like a few different things. We'd met regularly to just talk about topics that were coming up. Um, so for instance, what does equity mean to us? Or how can instructors increase participation? What impacts motivation? 
some more specific stuff um, as the semester unfolded. Um, and that really informed all of the programming we were doing at CTRL and the content we included in some of our workshops. And then all these students, what they're sharing here with you today is simultaneously worked on their own individual projects um, based on their interests, their passions, and what they saw as a need for this campus. Um, so with that, we'll get started on um, sharing these individual projects as the rest of the session will be dedicated to that. And as Gavin said, each student um, or each project, because Kimai and Reba work collaboratively, uh, will be presented and then there will be Q&A after each presenter. Um, so feel free to add thoughts in the chat as you're going um, and then we'll open up the floor once they're done sharing. All right, Allie. Hi everyone, my name is Allie Sattler. Um, my project addressed increasing inclusivity within STEM classrooms and I am majoring in math and secondary education. When I was brainstorming potential projects for me to pursue this semester, I was immediately drawn to the prevalence of inequities existing throughout STEM education due to my underlying interest in pursuing a career in math and education. Although the topic of inequities existing within STEM education is quite vast, I decided to focus on three main categories, being lectures, course resources, and assessment. With each of these subsections in mind, which I will go into more detail with in the following slides, it becomes clear that there are numerous inequities that continue to persist within STEM education, which I'm hoping to address and combat in my presentation. So Hannah, could you please move to the next slide? So um, here's part of the data that I collected, which was um, predominantly in the form of interviews. And I made this infographic, which you can see on your screen. Um, so in order to learn more about the inequities that exist within STEM education, I interviewed some of my peers within various STEM fields, as well as read the book STEM, STEAM, Make, Dream by Chris Emden, which addresses many of the inequities that I had noticed. Prior to these interviews, I created an infographic with the same categories that I previously mentioned, lectures, course resources, and assessment. Um, in which I present the challenges and solutions within each topic. In interviewing my peers, I explained the rationale behind my project, showed my infographic, and asked about their personal experiences in STEM courses at AU. In doing so, these um, interviews both validated my personal experiences, as many of them aligned with my own experiences, as well as provided me with insights on experiences outside of my own. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so more into the data that I collected and ma mainly with the challenges side of my project. Um, the general inequities that both my interviewees and I noticed were the lecture centered nature of STEM courses, the singular, um, the use of a singular expensive source, oftentimes being a textbook, and tests being the sole form of assessment. Oftentimes within STEM courses, Classes are lecture dominant, which typically provides little opportunity for students to participate. Within the subtopic of course resources, STEM courses often require a singular, bulky, pricey textbook. Further, such courses are neglecting the addition of a free or reduced option for students to make use of, as well as neglecting to include diverse perspectives. In contrast with humanities courses, which typically provide numerous supplemental sources focusing on intersectional lenses, STEM courses more often than not omit such diverse um, materials. Finally, in terms of assessment, STEM courses typically focus on exams, which often make up the majority of one's final grade. However, this becomes a challenge for many students as not all students are good test takers, um, as well as tests becoming a major stressor for students since exams are making up such a substantial portion of one's grade. Additionally, in, in contrast with humanities courses, a participation grade is often included in the makeup of students' final grades, which tends to be omitted in STEM courses as well. Uh, next slide, please. So in order to combat these challenges existing within STEM courses, there are some key takeaways and solutions that I considered through analyzing both my peers' experiences as well as my own. 
In terms of STEM courses often being lecture dominated, the value of hands-on experiences within the classroom becomes evident. Whether it be labs in science or in-class practice in math, it is important for students to practice the skills they are learning in class while also feeling supported by the professor. In addition, the lecture dominance of STEM courses often causes students to feel as though their voice is not valued, that their participation does not matter, or that if they ask a question, their professor may think that they are unintelligent. With these fears that many students have, it becomes increasingly important for professors to set the stage at the beginning of the semester, making students feel comfortable participating and asking questions, as well as providing more opportunities for students to participate in class. Whether it be through students explaining a technique to the class or students working in small groups, it is important to provide interactive aspects throughout lecture to not only engage students, but to also aid in students' comprehension. So then in terms of course resources, it is important to implement free or reduced course material options as well as represent a variety of perspectives. In terms of incorporating free or reduced options, some courses can become much more accessible for students if professors make a conscious effort to find resources that are either free or reduced in price. As I previously mentioned, the lack of diverse perspectives represented in some course resources. It becomes increasingly important to implement perspectives of those coming from various communities and backgrounds. Despite the renowned theorists um, being substantial contributors to various STEM fields, most of these acclaimed theorists are old white men, which causes STEM subjects to become increasingly exclusive. By implementing diverse course resources, students are able to see themselves represented within the course materials and thus feel more motivated and capable of being successful in the given domain. And then lastly, in terms of assessment, a key way to combat the test-centeredness of STEM courses is to integrate multiple means of assessment and encourage participation. As exams are typically a large stressor for students, it becomes clear that the use of a singular assessment tool may not always be effective for all students. In order to best meet the needs of all students, professors can incorporate multiple means of assessment, whether that be including projects, graded homeworks, or smaller quizzes. Finally, to encourage participation, it can be effective to incorporate a participation grade into students' final grades, which will not only serve as an incentive to participate, but also cushion students' grades. Um, and then next slide, please. Um, so then in terms of like my personal thoughts and takeaways for myself, um, I have truly valued my experience this semester working with CTRL and being able to create this project. With the creation of this project, I have gained a greater understanding into the unique challenges that STEM students face. And further, by completing interviews with my peers, I was able to both validate my own experiences as well as gain insights into other STEM domains that I am not as familiar with. However, outside of my new understanding stemming directly from this project, I have gained a greater sense of agency and urgency, particularly in terms of my passion for addressing these systemic inequities within STEM education. Further, the work that I have done um, has, not, has also served as a source of self-empowerment since I've been able to research what interests me and have the capability to promote change on campus and beyond. Additionally, this work has also inspired me to be a better educator and figure out what kind of educator I hope to be. And that being said, I truly appreciate this opportunity and being able to present my project to you all today. So please feel free to ask any questions that you may have or learn more about my project on the CTRL website. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ellen. Um, now we'd like to invite uh, you, the audience, to ask uh, Ali any questions you might have about her uh, project, our experience uh, as a student partner. Um, and, you know, to uh, get you started, I'll point out that you should uh, please raise your hand, use, be using the raise hand function, and or put questions in the chat. Um, and I'll be the first to ask a question. Allie, 
Um, what did you enjoy about this work and how did thing and how did doing this work inspire you? Um, well, I really enjoy this work for many reasons. I I really enjoyed our weekly meetings because they kind of um, made me think a little bit more about the practices that I was seeing in classes and kind of think about like how that affects different students and just creates different experiences for students. Um, and I think that this work in general just has inspired me to um, want to make education and specifically STEM education more equitable and especially for someone who um, hopes to be um, a math teacher. I really hope to make my math course as inclusive and equitable as possible. All right, uh, thank you. That, that sounds like a noble goal. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, Donna asks, did you find any styles or specific instructors in the math stat department that you would recommend as ideal models? Um, well, this is um, pretty fresh in my mind, and she actually is on the call today, um, but I had Professor Schiffman this past semester um, for differential equations, and something that I really enjoyed was how we had in classwork, so, and the, so the questions were kind of crafted by Professor Schiffman, um, which, so they kind of modeled what the exams would look like, but also kind of, but in smaller doses, if that makes sense. So it wasn't like as daunting as an exam in itself, but um, it provided opportunities for students to practice what we had covered in the previous lecture or like two lectures ago um, to make sure that you're understanding the material as best as possible, which I thought was really effective. And we have another question. Amara asks, Chris Emden's work is phenomenal. Uh, so I'm curious what connected with you that enabled you to apply his scholarship to STEM teaching in math? Um, well, I, um, Hannah actually connected me with his work. Um, she just thought I would find it interesting. And I um, read the book and I thought it was really interesting as well um, because it connected so deeply with what I was um, kind of addressing within my project. So I thought that it really um, like added to what I was bringing forth um, because a lot of what he addressed was similar to what I was like seeing within my courses um, specifically with um, kind of the idea like you can't be what you can't see he mentioned um, which I thought was really important to bring forth because I think so often it's really not um, talked about that um, it's so important to kind of implement um, different resources within STEM education and honestly all courses in general um, in order for all students to see themselves represented, whether it be different gender identities or um, backgrounds, just so all students can feel capable of that success. Uh, this is less a question than a comment, but Jody in the chat says, Ali, I'm excited about these insights and love hearing how you apply this in your own teaching. Uh, secondary students need STEM teachers with this perspective. Um, so I think that's that's very positive. Um, uh, I guess if uh, we, we can give folks time to think of more questions, but one way to, to perhaps consider this would be to ask, um, uh, how, Allie, do you have any questions for instructors about their teaching practices, or do you think there are any particular insights from your project that um, that instructors uh, might want to know that, but you didn't include in your um, resource? Um, I mean, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> I was going to say, adding to that, how... What, what advice might you give to those who aren't even teaching STEM courses about mm -hmm. these insights? Like, how do these apply beyond the STEM context? I mean, I think no matter what um, domain um, a professor is in, I think it's really in, um, important to um, consider the balance between lectures within a course um, and consider um, 
incorporating more time for students to participate because that allows students to engage not only engage with the material but to also better understand the material and i think all courses can um improve by incorporating diverse materials um, and especially ones that kind of can relate to a variety of students and i also think that all all courses can benefit from various means of assessment just because all students are different and have different needs. So we have another question. Alyssa in the chat asks, do you think the lecture to practice balance can be appropriately addressed by a lab component? Um, I think that definitely um, does help for science courses, but at the same time, um, I I did take a science class for like my habits of mind requirement as well as um, during my interviews with um, some science students. Um, it's I still was under the impression that um, it didn't seem like that the separate lab was enough, per, if that makes sense, um, just because the lecture is still an hour and 15 minutes long and that not being broken up by something more interactive or asking a question out to the students just to break up that lecture so students can continue to be engaged and make sure that they're staying on top of the material being addressed. All right. Thank you so much, Ali. Yeah. We're on the same page, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and Gavin had put in the chat earlier the link to Ali's um, resource, but we will also be sharing all of these resources with you all at the end, especially to, to be able to zoom in on that great infographic that she created. Uh, Donna's putting some virtual claps in the chat. <laughs> All right, so our, our next student partner sharing is Nate. So I will hand it over to you, Nate, to introduce yourself and your project. Yes, hello, everyone. Um, first and foremost, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Smith. I am a sophomore uh, studying secondary ed, uh, and my focus major is in history. Um, and I also have a minor in literature. But today I'll be presenting on of varying means of participation uh, to support all learners and kind of some background on how I came to picking this topic. Um, when we first started working at CTRL, uh, we looked through the website on what resources um, they already had. And I saw on their page uh, promoting and accessing participation in the classroom. And so I thought to myself about how college classes do that um and i was kind of curious uh and i asked some of my friends i was like you know what type of participation happens in your class and i got a lot of feedback um on it's mainly student to professor meaning the student will be asked a question uh, they'll answer it uh and the professor will respond to them and so my goal in this presentation is to think about participation in a more equitable uh diverse way changing the dynamic primarily from um lecturers versus facilitators uh providing suggestions on how to do that um and then highlighting the fact that a professor's response to uh, students when they are participating affects future engagement um so without further ado next slide so understanding uh, equity of participation and what do I mean when I say this? So students learn and engage with information differently. We all understand that. Uh, but therefore, grading how students participate needs to reflect that. So oftentimes it's in-class participation that is incorporated into that participation grade. But what does that mean? What forms of in-class participation are there? I found that in my um, talking with students, which was the way I wanted to go about doing my survey and understanding how different classrooms have participation, I found out that there's not often a lot of outside participation, meaning like 
discussion boards on Canvas or various uh, projects implemented to design participation outside of the classroom. Um, and then off of that online participation, right? It's not just maybe having um, a presentation that's collaborative outside of the classroom, but as I mentioned, um, you can have discussion boards. Uh, you can have various things through Canvas um, and tools that the university offers. So uh, including and communicating to your students, right, that we have this variety of participation in the class to engage uh, diverse learners, those who may not be as um, participatory in the classroom or speak up, uh, communicating this to them uh, will first and foremost increase participation. Um, and then if we're limiting uh, participation from uh, one student, uh, the goal is just to convey uh, their knowledge. Um, so next slide. So consider this, this is something I came across when I was doing my research and it really honestly shocked me, uh, which is according to Education Week, 70 to 80% of the time in a college class is taken up by professors talking. And this just stood out to me, um, one, because that's a drastic change uh, from what I believe my education classes, and I know that's different uh, for each major, but that's just something that stood out to me. And then this uh, 70, 80% only leaves 30% of the time for students to actively engage in the material and participate in uh, these various ways that I'm going to talk about. Um, so if the idea of learning is to have students hands on with their material, and what they're trying to wrap their head around, then I think we need to give them the opportunity, as I say here, to question, talk, and discuss the topic. Listening is one facet of learning, which is important, but what I'm saying in this presentation and my research that I've done is that I think that's only one component and we need to utilize the other ones a lot more. So next slide. So. This, this idea of becoming a facilitator versus a lecturer. What do I mean by that? Oftentimes, professors are taught uh, to lecture and be professors in their subject, but not taught how to implement specific educational strategies. Uh, so if we're trying to create a more uh, student-centered classroom where professors can observe, add on to, facilitate, uh, student conversation and participation, it's critical to implement uh, these different forms, which I'm going to talk about now, which is student to student conversation uh, and participation. And one way to do that is through a teaching move that I've learned in my education classes um, and is on my research on the website, but is uh, this idea of think, pair, share. Some of you might have heard of it but breaking students up into groups, asking them to think about a topic, a question you pose, pair up and then share their ideas, right? And then if we're thinking in the mindset of a professor is supposed to facilitate, they can now go around and observe how that participation is happening, get a better understanding of how much their students actively know and can regurgitate about the information they're learning. Um, student to content, Antip anticipatory reading guides. Oftentimes students will have a very long complex chapter that can't always be covered in class, right? So thinking about how can I engage students outside of class, having three or four questions you want them to think about and then ultimately answer when they're reading so that they know what to look for when they're reading and then it kind of guides their mind as they're reading through the chapter for some students who might have trouble comprehending it or understanding what is the important uh, key points I'm supposed to take from this. Um, student to self participation or engagement with material is critical. Um, and one concept, which I'll talk about later, that came up a lot in my interviews with students was this idea of activating prior knowledge. Um, 
oftentimes in a class, right, we have this higher level of college thinking and vernacular uh, that prevents this um, prior knowledge to be utilized in the classroom. So how can we structure, scaffold our questions to take information that a student might have learned in high school or even in another uh, habits of mind or course at AU and how can it to apply to this um, so that they don't feel as lost and can participate more. Uh, and then student to professor participation, which oftentimes is the most used in classrooms right now. Um, I think a creative way uh, to not just have uh, right, a professor ask a question, student answers, and then it shuts down the conversation. Have a creative student presentation. Uh, have multimodal assignments where students present to the class and the professor kind of becomes the student and can add on to what a student is saying or the type of presentation they're doing. Um, so I think all of this is very critical to learning. Um, and this shift of learning uh, kind of puts the student in control of what information they're learning. Uh, it will help them retain the same level of information with the professor there to guide the lesson. So you're not losing any information by having this shift from lecture to facilitator. Uh, and then students uh, are given the opportunity to critically think and participate more when they're challenged to actively communicate to their other students, present uh, and be asked questions and be able to engage in the conversation instead of just listen to it. So next slide. So your response matters. I mentioned this earlier, but this was one of the most interesting things that I, I kind of talked to a bunch of students about when I did the interview, which was, um, the response that professors give to students who participate oftentimes in the beginning of the class or the semester will affect the likelihood for other students to engage and answer future questions. So as a student, I think we often realize this, but I got a lot of feedback, but from talking with Hannah in our weekly meetings and everyone is that, you know, professors don't always realize that, you know, if I maybe spin a response from a student and say that's wrong, that's not correct, which doesn't happen often, but even the response that they give, students are watching that. And if it's if it's maybe not what students are comfortable doing, which is if it's a tough question, they might not know the answer, they don't have that prior knowledge, they don't have uh, control of the learning that, they're less likely to participate in the future. And then you're stuck with the same kids. Oftentimes that happens in classes with these three kids, four kids, whatever it is, are participating. And then how do you engage those other students? Well, like I said earlier, maybe consider the response you give, but also engaging them outside of the classroom. It doesn't just have to be participating in the classroom. And so I think this, this um, picture here does a great job of saying that teacher directed learning say two of these students right here that you see are participating and the other two are observing they might get shut down but if the teacher and professor is in the center everyone is kind of facilitating around each other there's not one type of presenter everyone's information uh and and ideas and questions are all like a blend together um, kind of ultimately forming every student's idea of the concept a professor is trying to teach. Um, and so I think this, this model of teaching is incredibly important, not only for students to participate more, but to retain information more uh, and just to engage in the classroom. And so before I go on to answering your all's questions, I would just like to say that when I was going through figuring out what presentation I wanted to give, how I wanted to interview students, and the questions I wanted to ask, um, I was struck by the fact that I'm incredibly lucky to be put in this position through CTRL and being a student partner. Uh, oftentimes in college, I feel like the student voice uh, isn't fully heard 
or told to professors, in part because students themselves, I know this can check out, um, but this program, I think, has just given me the opportunity not only to engage in AU more, but also, um, as Ali said, do something that I'm very passionate about and have the ability to research, ask questions, and make this presentation and hopefully uh, make a change towards this style of teaching and classroom that I think is applicable to any professor, any department, and any student. Um, so hopefully you guys enjoyed it uh, and I'll feel free to answer any and all of your questions. All right, thank you, Nate. Um, once more, please raise your hand and or put questions in the chat. Um, and we're already getting some. So I, but first, before we get to the audience, I wanna give you a chance, Nate, to respond to the same question. Um, what did you enjoy about this work and how uh, did doing it inspire you? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I enjoyed from doing this work, uh, talking about student participation, interviewing my friends, is that not only did I feel like I learned a lot, but I think just in interviewing my friends, they became aware of how much either they didn't participate in class or the forms in which they were only participating in. So that was really interesting. Like during the interviews, seeing uh, my friends, my peers and random students just realizing, oh, wow, maybe I only participate off of another student's response or maybe I only participate off of uh, a question that I feel I know or can answer and I don't push myself to ask these other questions. And so from that uh, interview and realizing what they were realizing, I kind of took a step back and I was like, okay, well, why is this happening? And that's where on the resource I made, uh, which is on the CTRL website, I talk about various moves on how to implement ways of part just participating more. Um, and I think it inspired me um, in part that I'm realizing this stuff now and having the ability to create uh, this presentation and therefore just more awareness in my own self when I become a teacher to hopefully, um, like Ali said, I think all of the students presenting want to implement it in our uh, work some way uh, for me in education when I become a teacher. We have we have an optimistic uh, question here in the chat uh, from Laura, who asks, based on your survey and your own experiences, what do you think the ideal ratio of lecture to discussion should be? So I think obviously it it does depend on somewhat of the material somewhat of the department but i think ultimately i think maybe say one class in a week say you have two classes in a week maybe one class has to be more lecture because you feel the need to tell students the information in the way they do it but that means the next class should probably be like a lot more engaging with that material uh participating uh and communicating about it i think I would like to say 50-50 on uh, lecture versus participating and engaging it, but I realized that that might not be 50-50 for every class. Just thinking when you're planning uh, your syllabus, and I think it does start when you're planning your syllabus on, okay, I should lecture 50, maybe even 40% of the time, um, and leave the other 50 to 60% of the time to have students engage with the material. And I think professors often sometimes get caught up on saying, I need to lecture. You can convey the same amount of information in the way you want it through the various texts uh, and assignments you sign outside of class. I think often, even when students are participating and if it's in that facilitator role, you can still guide, like I say, and make sure that students are learning and retaining the information you want. So I don't think it just has to be lecture. Um, so I would say 50-50, ideally, 
Um, but maybe if that's not realistic, uh, 60 to 40. Um, but I think that can be spread across, like I said, the whole semester. And it doesn't have to be every single class. Um, but ultimately thinking, OK, I should have enough classes where students are engaging with the material with the amount that I'm lecturing to them on it. Um, Jody in the chat asks, what do you think about electronic response options like polls or digital boards in face-to-face -face classes? Um, so I, I actually haven't had that uh, too much, but I think, I think it works. I think it, it, like I said, it's all in the way you utilize it and what it is. Um, electronic polls can be very a good way to assess um, quickly on how much information uh, students might have or if they might not understand a concept that shows a professor, okay, I need to do more work outside of class on how to make sure students understand this. I think one of the biggest things that you can utilize uh, electronic polls through is saying, not in a full assessment way where that it'll go into their grade, but how much do students actually know? If the goal of the course is to get students to understand a concept or realize something, right? A professor ideally should be checking in throughout the semester, both through tests and unofficial polls through this way on how much information do the students know. And if they don't know something, I think that's a signal of maybe I have a conversation with my class or I step back and say, what is it that is confusing them and how can I change my teaching so that they do retain the information? If, uh... Another question from Julia who asks, sometimes lecture ratio uh, depends on how much is expected to be covered. Um, should we reduce them? Uh, should we reduce then the amount of information? What is your perspective? So I I I agree on that. I think that um, like I said, it does depend on the class. Um, I can't speak for uh, say you know co-god classes or like a traditional law class at a school. Oftentimes there is a lot more information covered and I would agree that um, it depends on the class and how much information has to be covered but I think I would also say that if you are covering a lot of information and it is lecture format and you're considering reducing it I don't know how much um that would do. I think it would do a lot in the sense that students, students, if you reduce the workload, would probably understand the smaller amount of information they know more in depth. And if this is a course where it is adding on to another course, maybe it's a prerequisite for something, I think that's incredibly vital. Now, if this is a broader thinking course where there's some conceptual arguments that if students don't understand, it's not going to penalize them later, but ideally they should. That's a different thing. I think you can have more lecture style courses um, in that way. I think it's a tricky answer and I, there's no right or wrong way to say it, but I think it, it does depend on the class. What is the class's goal? Is it to create them to critically think and think differently in which you can probably lecture as much as you want, um because you're just asking them to think differently if they have to apply this information in the future i would say that would uh add more to cutting back on information and really honing in on making sure students learn and comprehend what i'm teaching because i think often students will just leave a classroom and forget it um sometimes because they're not asked to regurgitate it later um but other times just because there there is a sense i think from interviewing students that uh they will learn the information for a class a semester 
and it won't be asked for them again. So there's no incentive for them to learn it. Now that's a broader question and conversation, but um, yeah, I, d I do think the ratio depends on uh, the workload and what that work is asking of the students. All right, we do have a, another question from Alyssa, but perhaps Nate, you could respond to that in the chat um, because I think we should, we're about at the time where we should move on to our third and final um, project, um, which is Kamaya and Rebas. Would you both be willing to commence with your explanation of your project? Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you again for being here with us today. My name is Reba. I'm a rising junior and I work with Kamaya. If you want to introduce yourself really quickly. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kamaya. I'm a rising senior. I'm majoring in justice and law and minoring in education. And I just started on a combination master's in public administration. Um, so just to get into our project, um, we called it Enhancing the Educator-Student Dynamic at AU. And for our project, we sought to investigate the educator-student dynamics through examining specifically the student experience. So to accomplish this, we decided to facilitate a focus group with students enrolled in Dr. Althiria's Caldera's um, EDU uh, 437 Intro to Anti-Racist Pedagogy class. Um, so it was real students here that go to AU. And our goal was to really create a space for students that they felt comfortable sharing and authentically speaking and being honest about their experiences. But we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so in our focus group, um, we came away with some, our three takeaways. One being professor approachability and we created some questions to go along with the categories. So we have professor approachability, what factors affect how comfortable your students feel approaching you? Student vulnerability, how do we approach students' unique needs and understanding the students' vulnerabilities? And we'll go into each of the subjects. And then three, collective accountability. How can educators and students collaborate to cultivate a classroom community? And so these are just questions for educators to think about when um, going into classroom dynamics. Yeah, and so for professor approachability, um, we want to be careful about approachability. We are, at least we wanted to, because of how sensitive um, the idea of ensuring that someone else like sees you as approachable. Um, and so the Utah State University described approachability as categorized into friendliness, openness, accessibility, patience, and respect. We talked about this in our, um, our we put that in our resource, but approachability is not something that can be promised to every student, but it's something that all educators should be thinking about. And we also want to talk about how like students' perceptions and biases can have effects on how they view a professor. And so, yeah, educators have to create and maintain spaces where students can feel vulnerable. And in our next slide, we'll talk about student vulnerability. I think it would be helpful just um, in case people don't have their screen on to read the quotes too. So you can read the, the quote that's there. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so we just put focus group question, quotes on each of our slides, but it says, I have one professor who I think is so approachable and another who almost made me cry. Um, so our next takeaway was student vulnerability. Um, and just to dive a little bit into that, we realized through this um, focus group that it is vital for students to be able to be open to different teaching styles. 
and also be provided with those spaces to share without feelings of invasion. So students being vulnerable isn't something that should be required or been done on, on like certain times or on your timetable as an educator, but on their own terms and they need to provide that space that, in which they feel comfortable sharing. Um, and student vulnerability comes with educators validating students' needs and accommodations. And just to share a quote from our focus group, a student shared, it felt like they just know everything, speaking about um, their professor, and like they expect us to, and then I feel like I'm bad, I'm confused, I'm like they're supposed to be teaching me. Um, I think one of the main takeaways from this point was just a lot of frustration which was shared a lot and was like a common theme seen with students that we interviewed. Uh, but we can go on to the next slide, which is collective, yeah, collective accountability. Um, this really gets down to working to establish a strong and ethical classroom co community. And this needs to be a collaborative effort, both between educators and students. Um, this can involve incorporate, incorporating students into the course build, and that can provide us with a better sense of who the new group is. Um, students are not standard. You're coming in with new students every year. So the same methods might not always work for the same students as we've discussed before. Um, and the ultimate goal that we want to achieve is an etiquette of care and respect for both educators and students. Um, and this was another quote shared. It was in this class, which was the class we interviewed EDU 437, we got to help make the syllabus and it, it was really cool. So it was really um, interesting to hear about how Dr. Caldera really went over her syllabus with her students and allowed them to make edits and it really helped contribute to this uh, theme that we wanted to talk about, which was collective accountability and really focusing on that classroom community. Um, we can go to the next slide. So just some takeaways that me and Kamaya wanted to share. For me, I think through this project and just even working with Kamaya, working with Hannah and Gavin and with the students, I, I think I personally gained a deeper understanding of student educator relationships and kind of those dynamics. And it was really um, rewarding to me to be able to sit down and hear from my peers and also provide a space where they feel validated for their experiences. And I think through this um, investigation, we were able to learn and see what a strong and inclusive classroom culture can look like. Um, come on. Yeah, and for my takeaways, um, it was like the first time that I kind of felt like a you change maker type thing. So it was a really empowering experience to be kind of student voice on the outside. Um, and I also reignited a passion that I had for advocating for student voice inside the classroom. I think as many student organizations as we have on campus, sometimes those student organizations aren't really putting, are having a seat at the table when it comes to inside the classroom and what's happening involving that. And so um, it just was a great time. And I really enjoyed our focus group in providing just a comfortable space for my peers and being able to just like talk out what we feel like some things that could be improved or enhanced at AU. All right, thank you both for your hard work and uh, putting this project together. Um, Y'all know the drill at this point, please raise your hand and or put questions in the chat. Um, to get us started, um, I'd like to ask both of you, what did you enjoy about this work and how did it inspire you? Um, I can go. I think we shared a little bit before in the last slide, but personally, I think it was nice to really get back to that cycle of learning that can happen. And while we did focus on student experience this time, it, it was really nice to hear back and learn from my peers. And I feel like we forget that that can happen in the classroom. Um, it's educators and students learning from one another. So I really enjoyed that process. And like Kamaya shared, I think it did reignite like a passion for learning in general for me.
I think what I enjoyed most was just getting to like sit down and speak with my peers about how they felt their classrooms are going. Um, our, yes, we talked about our one class that we were in, um, Dr. Caldero's class, but we got to talk about how we experience similar things in other classrooms. And so it kind of felt like, oh, okay, so this isn't just something that like I'm feeling, like this is something that we can talk a little bit more about. And yeah. We have a question in the chat from Donna who asks, if students and faculty both bring their own particulars to the student-teacher relationship, how can a faculty member make the student feel more accepted? How can a faculty member make it easier for students to approach them? Um, I think it's a hard thing, like we mentioned before, like professor approachability, because there's so many ways to do it. And also you don't have much time when you're in the classroom to really have the time to create those relationships. But I think something that we discussed a lot in our meetings at CTRL was setting that up kind of the first week of class or syllabus week is making it clear to students that you are a resource to them and that you're open to uh, hearing from them and like you are there to listen to their vulnerabilities like we discussed. I think that goes a long way. Just like even saying that sentence like, oh, I'm here to listen to you because that's not always a distinction that's made clear. And I feel like that can go a long way in encouraging students to come to you and also making them feel accepted because you're opening up a space where you're engaging the student and providing them a space where they feel like they're going to be heard and they're going to be accepted. But again, it's a very hard task. And I think there are multiple ways, but. I also think when it comes to like strong personalities, like this, it, it can be a learning opportunity for the student to understand like in times you can be passionate, but sometimes you have to like, I guess, come to an agreement and understand that the agreement and like each parties are understanding that disagreement is benefiting both parties and so really un explaining to the student why things are the way that they are is a great place to for that student to understand like oh maybe this is something that I agree with or vice versa. Laura in the chat asks, can you please explain what feelings of invasion are? It's not a phrase I've heard before, and I'd like to know what it is slash what it means. Yeah, so feelings of invasion are essentially, um, students are in a place where like they are on their own for the first time, and really big things can come up. And so as much as, or as easy as it could be to like explain that situation to a professor, sometimes it's not the first like impression that you wanna to give to your professor. And so that feeling of invasion, like I have to tell my professor like all my deepest, darkest secrets in order for them to like, give me a break on my homework or like situations like that. I don't know if Reba wants that. Yeah, I think that was a really good explanation. And I think it often, especially after the pandemic was something that we experienced, I think approaching professors and trying to not come up with excuses, but provide explanation for like either our work in the classroom or just like our presence in the classroom can be very difficult and a very vulnerable experience. And it's come up a lot during the pandemic. So I think it's been very hard for both educators and students to like try to navigate when to give students a break, when to reach out and ask for help. So I think that feeling of invasion is a good way to describe that kind of like anxiety that can come with this, with approaching this topic. But I think Kamaya explained it really well. 
If you, you don't mind adding, I noticed you have some notes in, pull up this slide again. That I'm not sure you totally went into, but I think are some really important points if you want to share those. Uh, about not prying on students. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I had just wrote down like making sure that you're not prying on personal lives. So for example, students' income, employment, relationship status, those can just be some like quote unquote tri triggering issues. Um, however, it is encouraged for students to be open about their interests, their passions, and their wonders that the class materials can support them. And so they are sharing that their passions, their interests, but they're not necessarily sharing their personal lives. I think that's a really great point. Something I, I need to think more about is that we're often thinking to be approachable and to create this welcoming space that we need to get to know our students, but there should be boundaries around that is I think what I'm hearing you say and that getting to know your students has its limitations and that there's still um, boundaries, professional boundaries to maintain. All right. Um, are there any other questions that folks have for Reba and Kamaya? Um, if not, then you can please, you're welcome to post them into the chat at any time, or we might hang around for a bit at the end of the session if, uh, if anyone has any that come to mind. Um, Hannah, would uh, you like to go to the next slide? Ah, yes, there we are. Thank you. Um, so in the chat, as a final reflection, please share what is one way you apply the students' perspectives in your teaching? I think as people are, are thinking on this question, uh, I'll just put up the next slide and say thank you first and foremost to these amazing students for working with us over this past semester, for trusting me, um, for being so open and willing to try out all these things and build this program together. So thank you all very, very much. Um, we, they will, all four of these students will be continuing to work with CTRL in the fall along with two more students. Um, so there will be more resources to come, more presentations to come, um, more opportunities to talk. And I will drop the link in the chat just to the main page where you can follow the program and access their resources. Um, yes, it's been, uh, it's been an uh, enlightening and um, uh, thrilling process really to, to get to know these students and to, and to really see how passionate they are about improving the, te the, learn the teaching and learning experience of themselves and their peers. Um, I'm very excited to see what projects they have coming up for the fall and um, to see where this program goes. Um, and thank right. you all well, for joining we us. We just wrapped up, but Shed put a really great question in the chat. Ooh, that I might okay. Need to read. <laughs> so go right ahead. Curious. Um, how each presenter imagines the future of higher education. What's a major change or aspect you imagine? And I guess you could take this in a, an optimistic or a pessimistic direction. I can go quickly. <laughs> I was gonna say, I really like the phrase that me and Kamaya use, which is like the etiquette of care. And I think that although sometimes educators and students can feel like the system is working against you I think it's nice especially like all of you here who like came and took the time out of your busy days to make the effort and learn from students and just like listen I think that is a very important thing to remember and I think an etiquette of care for yourself like appreciate the effort that you're putting in and I appreciate my fellow student partners and Hannah and Gavin but that's not that's a cheesy answer but that's what I wanted to say
I can add on to that. I think like one of the biggest things I feel like I would like to see a change in higher education is, um, I mean, to put it simply and bluntly, like I feel like the style of teaching needs to change. I heard a quote the other day that like various aspects of our life has like changed and evolved um, since our parents were in school and stuff. And then you look at a college classroom and oftentimes it's still very similar. And I know that's kind of like a cynical way of looking at it, but I think that like changing how professors lecture and teach um, through all of the presentations that we talked about is just better for the students and better for what the goal of that class and broadly an institution should be is to help students uh, retain, think differently, question, understand, and learn. Um, I think that should be addressed and changed in a more student-centered way, but yeah. Agreed, agreed. <laughs> so shed chairs, thank you. I love the focus on educative care, centering student experiences. Sounds like compassion and vulnerability are central. Absolutely. Uh, I know we're, we're a few minutes before our allotted ending time. So if anybody has one last burning question, feel free to raise your hand um, or put it in the chat. We see a hand raised. Yeah, Julia. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Hi. I actually do have a question to all of the students. Maybe you already thought about it or asked other students and surveyed them. It's about projects. Um, so I do projects in upper level courses, 400, 600, and they work very well. But whenever I tried projects, for example, in 300 level courses, for some reason, I can never figure out how to make it work well. And here is a few things that I have been um, experiencing. So the group in the group project, you will have some students who would work really hard. And then those that, I'm sorry for lack of better word, slackers. And how do you deal with those students is my question. What do you think we should do because students, those that work hard, then would come to me and complain that there are students on a project that don't want to do much work. Then I'm trying to, of course, address that. And it's not always possible. And sometimes it actually doesn't work. So I just would like to hear your perspective, or maybe you can make another study, and then you can tell us what students think about um, how to deal with group projects. Um, and that's as much as I have. <laughs> I can start. Um, I think this is, a. I feel like as much as like we're in college, like we are really still learning how to be humans. And so understanding the base level of like communicating in creating that professional communication between your group partners is something that some students don't know how to do. And so, and I don't know how you introduce them or anything, but really ensuring that that communication is stick, like is being had rather than like, oh, well, I assume that they would like work together. Well, it's never the assumption and students that do take my courses, they know that they do follow up, but uh, things still do happen. <laughs> and my solution lately was I just removed projects from 300 level courses because I could, could not find a solution because you're trying to communicate, but I can only go so far. Students also have to communicate back to me. And when that is not possible, I simply sometimes don't know what else to do to make them talk, right? So I can fix whatever issues the group is experiencing. I would say, and it, it is a very difficult um, problem, especially because it's not always gonna be like the same group of students. I think 
For me, I recently had a group project and the professor had like daily check-ins. Um, so you could try allotting time within your class session if that works to give people time to work in person, like really like designating time for them so they don't have to go out of their way to communicate outside of classroom time to try to find time to work on it. Um, I think like Kamaya mentioned before, a big thing is like students don't feel that they have like the ability to communicate with their peers. So another thing could, that can like help with that is maybe allowing students to pick their groups. I don't, I don't know how you assign groups or um, trying to facilitate like student interactions. Like Nate mentioned before, like even having like group discussions, just getting like students uh, acclimated with one another or sorry, acquainted with one another. So they like get to know each other so they maybe feel more comfortable. Um, and then also an alternative could be giving an option, maybe like modifying the project, um, having an option for those who do not wanna be in a group, making pairs even, or allowing students to work by themselves or be able to work in the group, like giving them a choice in that. So you wouldn't have to completely cut out the project idea because I think projects or end group projects can really be a good alternative and they do help with communication, but I understand that it's it can be hard with students. Especially, I feel like after um, being online, it, it's been hard to like get back into doing group projects. I know I have personally struggled a lot with it too. If I yes. can just hop on for just one more second about um, in response to this question, because um, we did talk about it in um, quite a lot of detail, like in um, at least a couple of our like weekly meetings. Um, something that we talked about that I thought was really important was kind of how the size of a group plays a big role. So kind of because I've had a presentation or a group project that also was a presentation that was, um, it was like 10 to 15 people in the group, which was not productive, if you can imagine. Um, so I think just finding that balance is really important. And so groups can find like a role for each individual. And um, so it's not overwhelming for students as well. Yes, th thank you, everybody. And I do, well, in general, I have small groups, so that was never an issue having large groups. But um, like I had, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is when you see that students, some students would like to work on their own, I do allow that. And when I see that students would like to work maybe with other students later on, I also do allow that. But sometimes what happens is because they want to work now on their own, I have to also adjust the projects for them. And then the other groups feel they're doing more, <laughs> even though you're trying to explain that you have more members. So th 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 this actually still creates tensions. And so I think maybe guys, if you think about this and then you know uh, talk to more students at AU and see their perspectives, that would be great to know how to handle this type of situations. W what works best for you guys? Yeah, I think this is a, a huge point that we will <laughs> probably take with us into the fall and create some resources around. But thank you for bringing up that question and that topic. I do wanna recognize that we are beyond time. So if, if people are hanging out because they're feeling like we haven't closed the session, do feel free to leave if you need to. Um, but I think we could stick around for a few more minutes if there are people who are on the call who still have follow-up questions or um, anything else.